It couldn't have been that clear now. <laughs> All right, let me turn it around. Who, which site has a question? Does anyone have a question at any site? Uh, we have a question here at NCSA. Uh, let me remind all sites to make sure that the people asking the question have a microphone. Uh, yes, I was curious as to what kind of interconnect Blue Waters has. So uh, we can't actually say too much about the interconnect. Uh, at this point, uh, I can say it's a graph, and it's a two-level graph interconnect. It's a mixture of copper and optical interconnect. Uh, we'll be able to, I think, by next month, reveal a lot more about the interconnect because IBM's going to be talking about the interconnect at several conferences uh, in August. The bisection bandwidth is at least an order of magnitude more than you see on currently existing systems. Uh, the latency, we're conservative. We're saying it's going to be around a microsecond. We're actually hoping it'll be less than a microsecond. But stay tuned for the details. Okay, any other questions from any other sites? A question at Nix. Go ahead, Nix. Yeah, I was um, wondering if the multiple core is the only thing going for high performance computing. I mean, it's what we have now, but is there any other technology maybe down the road that might replace that? Well, as, as you can imagine, people are thinking a lot about this at this particular point. We kind of blundered into multi-cores because that was the only way the computer industry could quickly think about how it is that they could increase performance while not increasing the frequency. Uh, but we're just at the beginning of all of that. So I think you're right in pointing out that there are potentials, possibilities out there that uh, certainly, you know, besides the, the mini core, uh, that I mentioned. There are certainly lots of other possibilities out there, but we're right at the beginning of uh, really investigating uh, all of that. We have another question from NCSA. Uh, yeah, you talked about the efficiency of the building in Blue Waters, and I was wondering how, what things you've done to achieve that. What exactly makes it different than other facilities? The, the, the facility itself? Yeah. Uh, so uh, one of the things that we do is that we do power conversion only once. So we step the voltage that comes down. So we, Blue Waters is fed by three separate electrical systems. One is the university's power grid itself. So the university can generate about 80 megawatts uh, of power. And then we have two separate feeds uh, from Ameren, which is our local service provider here, coming from two different grids. So. Uh, but one of the things that we do is we step the power down to the 480 volts or whatever that's directly used by the computers, and we only do that once, and then everything is fed, that 480 volts. So that, that's an efficiency uh, savings that we have there. The other thing we have is that uh, you didn't see it on the picture that I showed you, but down at the far, if you're looking at the facility, down at the far right end of the facility are three cooling towers they actually hold water for uh, cooling the machine itself. Uh, the machine, unlike most computers, actually can run with 68 degree water. Uh, so we can use those cooling towers, 70% of the year would just be using the water from the cooling towers. The other parts of the year on a day like today, we would be mixing that water with the water that comes from the university's chilled water plant, which is at 45 degrees. So the amount, typically the amount of cooling, uh, energy for cooling uh, computer is 30 to 40% of the energy that you're feeding into the computer to begin with. Uh, and so basically we're saving a huge fraction uh, of that. Uh, in addition, we don't have a UPS system which also uses energy. So there are a number of much smaller things uh, that we've done to increase the efficiency of the facility. Are there any questions from any other sites? Uh, question from Muncie. Sorry, say it again. Minnesota. Oh, we have some questions. All right, I heard Minnesota first, so Minnesota, go ahead. Uh, I have a question regarding the GPU uh, future. How do you think um, the GPU eventually would be? Can it replace 
CPU or hybriding and computing of GPU with the CPU would be the um, better solution for HPC um, environment. Thank you. That, that's a question I think was actually related to the question that we got from, from Nix is are there new ideas for how it is that you might build uh, the processing units for something like uh, high performance computing? Uh, right now our experience has been uh, CPUs versus GPUs is because of this bottleneck that we have between the CPUs and the GPUs and then the inherent speed of the GPUs themselves. The more that we move the application over to the GPUs, the faster it gets relative to the CPU only uh, version. Um, but that's, that's partially a function of the slow interconnect uh, be between the two, uh, two processing units uh, itself. Um, I, I think it remains to be seen in the future exactly what happens. There are, there are um, some types of operations that are just not done very efficiently on the GPU itself. Uh, so there's been a very extensive study by a group at Intel, who of course may be somewhat biased uh, in this regard, but looking at what things can be done better on a, on a GPU or CPU than on a GPU. Uh, and it was actually, it's a very interesting article in that they did find that there are certain types of mathematical algorithms that are much better uh, executed on the CPU than on the GPU. Uh, but m my guess is that we may need this kind of mixture of the two, but uh, uh, again, with, there's a big design space to be explored there, and the computer designers are really only beginning to explore that space. Is there another question? Uh, questions from Nancy? Yes, UCLA has a question. Hello? Uh, uh, this is UCLA. Uh, I have a question. Uh, on the new program. UCLA has a question. Oh, ho hold on. Uh, UCLA, hold on. Hello? Yes, go ahead. Yeah, this is uh, UCLA. Hello. Could you talk about uh, the software infrastructure used in Blue Waters, like an operating system or a virtualization? Yeah, the, op the operating system will actually be Linux. We looked at both uh, AIX and Linux very carefully. We found out that actually in the end it was about a wash. That yes, AIX did some things better than Linux did, and Linux did some things better than um, AIX did, but the differences were never very large. And so for conformity with uh, the op operating system used on a lot of the other uh, machines around the country, we decided to go with Linux. All the rest of it will be built on uh, IBM's HPC uh, stack itself, which is right now undergoing significant uh, revision uh, with funding from DARPA. Okay, UCLA, do you have a question? What's UCLA? Anyone else? Go ahead and ask your question. Uh, Renzi has a question. Renzi, go ahead, please. Okay. Uh, I have a question on the new programming model. You have mentioned that the uh, last two slides. And uh, what could be the possible new programming model beyond the MPI at this stage? Well, one of the things that uh, we're working with uh, very closely with IBM on is UPC, Universal Parallel C. Uh, our goal there is to actually be able to achieve the same performance with UPC, with a uh, code written in UPC as we can with a code written using MPI itself. Now, I'm, I'm not positive that uh, UPC will be the uh, programming model for an exascale machine, but at least it's probably more down that path uh, than the current MPI uh, usage is. So there, there are a lot of these PGAS uh, languages that uh, are, are at this point starting to gain some traction and we'll just have to see which of them actually turn out to be a winner. 
Uh, as you probably, as you may know, uh, DARPA in the, its HP, HPCS program, this high productivity computing system program, also uh, made some investments in development of new programming models, uh, X10 by IBM and Fortress by Sun. Uh, we don't know if any of those are going to, to pan out or not, but I think it's important for all of you to keep your eye on these new programming languages, and as they start to mature, they may offer you a better path for programming these beasts uh, than MPI does. All right, that's the end of our uh, hour. Penn State has a question. Oh, all right, well, that's the last question. Penn State? Yeah, well, Penn State. You'll see a layer. Hi, sorry. Um, <clears throat> I guess my question uh, is is uh, coming from engineering department. Uh, it, it, you know, it's it's very it's interesting and it's it's uh, needed to to you know have these hardware advances and build these larger and larger systems and talk about you know petascale and exascale, et cetera. But uh, the, the big issue I see, and obviously these, these courses are you know a good good first step and and necessary. But the big issue I see is you know, for the actual applications, at least in my my departments, I've seen the the skill set and understanding is not there uh, to to use the types of software that are available, and then the types of software that are available for different types of uh, simulations don't scale well. So, unless you want to write your own code, which is becoming less and less feasible, uh, at least in my field, there there's really no way to use these systems, and they end up just being, uh, you know have many batches of smaller jobs on them as opposed to being used to their full capacity. So I'm wondering what, you know, apart from these types of courses, what can be done to, you know, increase the usage uh, of these types of systems at their full capacity, or at least approaching their full capacity? Well, you, you, Thank you. you hit on an extremely important problem, is that it does no good to build big machines unless you've got the software and the applications uh, to run on them. And that's currently is, is one of the failures that I see that we have in the system. It's much easier to convince an agency to buy a big computer. It's much more difficult to get them to, to invest in the software development activities that are needed to make full use of that kind of uh, capability. So we hear that's not only from our engineering colleagues, many of whom are using packages from ISVs, but we also hear this from industry. So industry, there are parts of industry that are very closely tied to what it is the independent software vendors uh, make available to them in terms of engineering uh, software. And as you say, a lot of those don't scale uh, very well. We see 32, 64 core scaling. Uh, occasionally we'll see one that'll be in the one to 2,000 range, uh, but that's about it. Uh, one of the things that we're hoping with this course is, in fact, to start to make a dent uh, in what's needed to educate the next generation of computational scientists and engineers as to what it is they need to do uh, to take advantage of these big systems. And it's, it's actually not just the big systems. One of the reasons that I talked about uh, the many core technologies is that whatever happens over the next few years, uh, that that technology will not only be used to build the exascale system, it'll be used to build the departmental petascale systems that all of you are going to have in your departments. Uh, and so it's going to present some of the same challenges, perhaps not to the extreme that an exascale system would, but it's the, the key is again going to be writing software that scales well up to tens, hundreds, and millions uh, of cores. Uh, so whatever feedback you can give us after you've gone through this course on how we can improve it and what else we might need to do, we would certainly uh, be delighted to, to get your insights.